I'm Dominique Durbany Sims. I am the new Senior Vice President at GVPI, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with our fearless leader, President and CEO, Taifa Smith Butler. Taifa, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> all right, all right. How about you? I'm doing well, also. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as you all know, Taifa is taking an incredible opportunity to become the head of Demos in just a few short weeks. Um, and so we want to take this time to just talk about, you know, what GBPI is looking forward to in our future and what's next for our organization and for Georgia altogether. Um, you know, we are sort of at this critical inflection point where Georgia faces a decision as we move forward in our recovery from the pandemic and the recession. Are we going to keep to the status quo or are we going to build a future where prosperity is in reach for every family? Um, and so let's just go ahead and jump right in, uh, Taifa. You know, you've been with GBPI for nearly a decade. Um, yes. Where is GBPI in this moment? And how did we get here? <laughs> That's a great question. And I'm so, so honored to have this opportunity in my last week at GBPI, which is, of course, bittersweet, to do a look back at where we are and where we've been and where we want to go in the future. And I would say where GBPI is now is at a really, I think, incredible juncture in uh, this moment in time where we are living uh, in a pandemic or post pandemic. Um, it's not over by any stretch, but I think we're on the, the backside of the roughest points of it. Um, and we've really had to grapple with history. Right. We've had to grapple with uh, policy choices that have uh, disenfranchised and disadvantaged many people uh, in this country, uh, in Georgia and in our in communities. And I think as we have been a fact based research driven organization since 2004, uh, looking at state uh, budget issues because budget is our middle name. And so we've always approached sort of economic opportunity for all Georgians through that lens of the budget, right? Our most important piece of policy uh, of leg legislation that shows us where our priorities are. And over the 17 years we've been doing this work, we've identified there have been huge missed opportunities in how we spend and allocate our dollars to support those who are most in need, uh, to support our infrastructure, to support our schools, our public schools schools, uh, to support our safety net, uh, to support jobs and opportunities for the middle class. So we've learned a lot over these last 17 years. And I think in this moment of the pandemic, all those things came to bear, right? The light was shown on that lack of investment, the fact that Georgia is among the lowest taxing states in the nation. And, and of course, you know, those challenges bore themselves out in our healthcare infrastructure when we were trying to manage COVID. And so I'm really excited that, you know, as we started as part of this national uh, network uh, state fiscal analysis in initiative that became the state priorities partnership that the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities sort of oversees a group of 43, 42 state policy organizations across the country who care about economic opportunity and advancing it. And as GBPI has grown and evolved from just the fiscal tax and budget, uh, you know, gurus that we are but also becoming a more multi-issue organization, right? Healthcare, uh, the safety net, human services, and how we think about uh, those services and government supports that can best help families in need. In addition to K-12 education, higher education, our workforce, wealth, um, entrepreneurship, just really looking at economic mobility overall um, has been part of what we've grown in our policy expertise. And I believe in the last five years, as we've started to think more intentionally about the data that we're reviewing and analyzing and disaggregating that we could not continue to sort of offer up this disaggregated data that tells a very disparate story for black and brown and rural Georgians, right? And those who are low income without calling out the policy choices that got us to those disparities into those inequities. And so uh, we've, I think, t turned a corner as an organization, as a think tank, as a research and advocacy, advocacy organization that is making the case for a race forward policy solutions because we have to. It's not because we want to be rebel rousers. It's not because we want to be contrary to sort of this political landscape that we live in. It is because it is necessary. If we want all Georgians to thrive, if we want all Georgians to have access to economic 
economic opportunity, then we really have to think about those who are most uh, challenged right now because of systemic barriers that have been uh, driven because of policy choices. So I'm excited to see GBPI and this team that has grown to nearly a stack of 20 with people who care deeply about uh, about this state and what we want to accomplish to make sure that we are advancing a people centered economic vision uh, that is really about making sure that all Georgians can thrive. And again, all. <laughs> That's right. Wow, thank you for sharing, you know, that that context. Um, I, I think a lot of that is really relevant for why I, you know, decided to join GBPI. Um, I've always respected GBPI and it's just been really exciting to watch the organization evolve to be more race forward in its policy research and analysis. And, you know, GBPI is a leader in the South around economic policy issues and, you know, the budget, as you said, really being the niche and I think the policy wins that you've already achieved, along with the momentum and visibility that Georgia is gaining nationally, just permit, pre presents enormous opportunities to transform uh, state policy and change lives, particularly for Black and Brown rural and low income people mm -hmm. in Georgia. Um, I've been working in the economic justice space for over a decade. Um, and, you know, I've done some work in the state policy advocacy um, area around EITC and Mm -hmm. individual development accounts and things of that nature. I've done asset building program design and service integration and some federal advocacy work around solutions to close the intersecting gender and racial wealth gaps. And I really try to approach this work with a lens on systems thinking um, and systems change, you know, that we have to understand the underlying drivers and the root causes of yes. economic inequality. Yes. We have to target our solutions there. And that means we also have to have, you know, a lens on racial and gender equity and any solutions that we're proposing. Um, and I know that GBPI has been on its own journey, as you mentioned, really striving to be an anti-racist organization. Um, and both, you know, in terms of the work we do externally, but also how we operate as an organization. Right. Um, and that's something I deeply believe in and definitely want to, you know, continue to support um, the work here that we're doing, as well as bringing that lens on gender. I mean, GBPI established the Women Power Prosperity Agenda um, a couple of years ago, and I'd like to see us continue uh, to focus on that as well, especially in this recovery, as we know who's been hardest hit. Um, right. And so... I'm really excited to be here, you know, and, and, and to continue to advance the work of this amazing team. Um, it's been so incredible getting to know everyone and seeing all the passion and dedication for the work here. Um, and so I think continuing on this journey to push for impactful change in Georgia, we have a lot of opportunities in this moment. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I mean, and to your point about opportunities, I think oftentimes those of us who are in this research policy arena, if we're not, you know, doing the research and trying to identify what the solutions are, there are movement partners who are on the ground trying to stay connected to people's real lived experience, to hear what the challenges are in communities and in schools, right? In all these places where they interact with systems and understanding how those systems have failed people and how we can think about policies that will influence our practice, you know, in community, but also I think help our state be a little bit more attuned to uh, addressing the needs. And I think, you know, as you know, I've done this work now in Georgia for nearly 20 years. I think it was really important that that we wanted to elevate a different story. You know, uh, working with the Kids Count Network and the Kids Count uh, grantee here in the state of Georgia for 10 years before my 10 years at GBPI. And for us to talk about and look at data and say Georgia is ranked at the bottom in education, ranked at the bottom in wages and wealth and health. I mean, and all these different things. And I'm like, when, do, when are we gonna be able to tell a different story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think part of the people powered prosperity uh, agenda that we put forward was if we want an economic vision that's going to make sure all people are thriving, what can we frame up that is sort of positive, that is transformative, that puts people in the center. And if we think about Georgia's economy, you know, we chunked it down into these four core pillars of educated youth. And, and how do we make sure our kids have the best education possible so that they can reach their full potential? How do we make sure we have a strong workforce? Because as much as GBPI, no, I'm as much as Georgia touts that we're the number one place to do business, we recognize that businesses want strong workforce and we have not 
invested in that workforce infrastructure to make sure that people have access to higher education, a technical college, free even, right? Um, and then thriving families and healthy communities. So if we have those four core things and there are policy interventions that we can offer, there is fiscal investment that we can make in those areas, we can have a very strong economy where Georgia can tell a different story, that we don't have to be at the bottom, we can be at the top, or even in, in the middle, right? <laughs> right, progress, right? Gotta right, start progress, somewhere. right. Oh my gosh. No, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, Dom, uh, before we transition to the other conversation, I'm just so excited, even as I'm departing GDPI, to have you and your talent. I've learned so much from you, um, just the work that you've done nationally at Prosperity Now with closing the women's wealth gap, and even as you helped us think about centering ourselves in community when we did listening sessions two years ago to really, again, change how research organizations approach this work. I think it's really important that we take stock of, you know, we're not academia, we're not the ivory tower who has all the bright ideas and coming at the world through our heads. We're trying to do both head work, but also heart work. And I think to make sure that we are in a position to connect with communities and hear their stories and let their lived experience and their stories and their needs and their desires and their dreams inform us yes. do our business. And so I just really thank you for pushing, you know, us as leaders to think more about that. And now that you're on the team, I'm, I'm really excited. So thanks. For <laughs> thank you, Taifa. And again, that's something I've just always admired about your leadership. I think you're always looking for opportunities to uplift others. Um, and I really appreciate all the support that you've shown me over the years. And I love what you're saying about the story and how we change the story. It makes me think about um, Aisha Nyandro, who's the head of Springboard to Opportunities in the Magnolia Mothers Trust, Trust, which is a guaranteed income program in Mississippi, said that you have to change the narrative by changing the narrator. Mm. And so, yes, and that's what kept coming to mind as we were talking about, you know, the, the story piece. And I think that's what we're trying to do. That's what we hope to do as well. Um, through the work of the PPP and working with our hyper strategic partners and with their members and constituents to really get their stories uplifted. Um, and through the listening sessions, you know, we're planning right now for listening sessions this summer where we That's can right. get out and hear directly from people in the state, you know, what what are your needs? What are your pain points? What are the opportunities you see? You know, how do we best support you through state policy change and through the budget? Um, and so I'm really excited to be here and to be supporting, you know, that part of the work as well. Um, you know, so tell me a little bit more, you know, given where we are as a state, um, how should we be envisioning policy change here in Georgia? And really what should GBPI's role be in that work? Oh, that's a great question. I think, you know, as, as we approach the future, you know, coming off the back end of this pandemic, and I know everybody has been having this conversation nationally about sort of building back better, um, you know, not going back to the status quo or, or there are others who are saying we want to get back to normal. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I want us to be just hyper uh, offensive on the fact that we can't go back to status quo, that we have to dream and, and rebuild and reimagine a better system. Because if we go back to yesteryear, we know that that system was inequitable. It's foster opportunities for rural communities where there is limited investment for black and brown communities where we know there's systemic barriers that are in place from all the policy choices from banking and finance and housing right those vestiges of systemic racism even though people want to say that doesn't exist we know based on history the policy choices that have been made that have disadvantaged certain races and certain ethnicities those are considered racist policies <laughs> reason why we are articulating ourselves as an anti-racist research organization is because we want to make sure the policies we offer do no harm. No more harm. And so how do we make sure the solutions that we offer the world can address equity, that can mm -hmm foster racial equity, ethnic equity for different types of people all across this state who may have been forgotten or may have been historically excluded because of certain policy choices. So I think that's where we see on this lever of policy change, we have to be intentional. And I also think we have to 
you know, again, keep dreaming and keep thinking about the transformative strategic idea <laughs> that is going to make change. Um, and I think, you know, as we go into an election cycle and we go into sort of this hyper partisan world that we're in and not going into, we live it right now every day that, you know, we do have to build bridges. We do have to find, you know, where there are those shared and common values. But at the same time, I think we need to be courageous. We need to stand on the, the, the like path of right. <laughs> righteousness if i if you will but i just think again we know too much <laughs> and i think with that knowledge becomes comes accountability and i think mm -hmm. at this point in time we also need that accountability lens with the ecosystem of organizations who organize out there in the world like right now we know what what we can do to make a difference how do we hold those accountable in those positions of power who who aren't making the right decisions on the behalf of the people. And I think that's where we as researchers, as policy analysts, as communicators, as you know, movement advocates, all that, where we can really work together to sort of push on what I believe is an important theory of change. If we want policy change in the world, we've got to have political will and we have to have public will. And we need the people to push on the public will to make the political will move. <laughs> So that's where I see on the horizon of us being much more strategically oriented and aligned because there's much work to do. Yes, I totally agree. I think uh, continuing to strengthen the relationships with the grassroots uh, community and their efforts and supporting them and doing the advocacy um, and telling their stories is, is such a critical piece of this. And I also see opportunities for us as we continue to work around the uh, federal relief funding that's coming to Georgia to really be an advisor um, around how those funds need to be spent in an equitable way and making sure that, you know, we continue to grow as a thought leader um, around federal policy advocacy and efforts to develop anti-racist policy solutions, um, both in the state and beyond. Absolutely. Um, you know, and what, are, what are some of those that you think are the most important at this point? That's a great question. I mean, right now we are still in a global pandemic and I think we have to continue to, you know, to push for this equitable recovery. The federal recovery plans have spent or have sent about $4.7 billion to Georgia in flexible funding. And so we have to hold our lawmakers accountable, as you said, to ensuring that those funds are used to promote an equitable recovery. Um, you know, we have to restore the cuts that were made in core areas of the Georgia State budget, particularly K through 12 education, um, and provide additional funding for students who live in poverty who are struggling and suffering more because of this pandemic mm -hmm. and recession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Congress can make the expansions to the child tax credit permanent and continue to fight child poverty, but here in Georgia, we can use some of those federal relief funds to provide living wages for you know, early child care providers and That's to great. invest in child care infrastructure, which we know is necessary and critical to supporting our recovery and to supporting working families and especially mothers. Similarly, you know, Congress can make the federal EITC expansions permanent. And Absolutely. here in Georgia, we can enact our own Georgia work credit you know, or a state EITC. Um, and we can structure that as a direct payment where we can deliver relief to nearly 3.5 million Georgians who earn low wages. And that's also going to support equity because it's going to support more Black and Latinx Georgians who are right. overrepresented in low paying jobs. That's right. So, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but there's so many things that we can do with this funding and we need to make sure that these funds are spent appropriately. Um, so Absolutely. we're, you know, we're working to try to hold our legislators accountable to try to get them to push to make sure that our leadership is using these funds in the right way. Um, I mean, what are some things that you're seeing as well? What are a couple of the solutions? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was laughing, you know, since I've been here nearly 10 years, we've been on this Medicaid expansion sort of bandwagon for 10 years and have had tremendous missed opportunity as a state. And I think that is something now that the federal government on um, the Biden administration has created these incentives for states who haven't uh, elected to expand Medicaid to do it. There is so much more incentive right now. And the fact that we uh, know based on the numbers and the fiscal impact of this, where there could be over 60, 68,000 jobs created as a result of Medicaid expansion dollars being accepted, right? There are hundreds and thousands of Georgians who could have access to healthcare today if we expand 
Medicaid. And so those are the things to me that are the most important around like policy levers that can make a huge difference. I mean, we continue to be ranked among the lowest uh, or the highest uninsured rated states. I think we're third in the country. There's no reason uh, for that with what we know. So the, these are choices, uh, deliberate choices to leave us in this place of uh, inequity. Um, for, for many, many Georgians, nearly half a million Georgians who don't have access to care. And I also think, you know, as we think about the growth of Georgia, and I think these are the trends that I see on the horizon, and, and at least the things that I've talked with partners and philanthropists, grant makers who are really trying to assess where is the biggest bang for our buck? Where should we be investing to support, support children and support families? And I think about our education system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as Georgia continues to diversify, we are projected to be a majority people of color state within the next 10 years. Um, and based on the data that we know in terms of income and wealth and poverty, people of color are facing inequitable, you know, outcomes if we don't do something different. Um, mm -hmm. One tremendous opportunity we have is to provide additional support for education, uh, public schools. We've heard from state you know, uh, educators all over uh, that have said, you know, poverty is a tr tremendous barrier to them providing the types of uh, equitable access to education that kids need today. They need additional resources, additional uh, schools in schools. And we are one of eight states that don't even factor poverty into the education funding formula. We could do that today, <laughs> you know by right. creating this opportunity weight where we can invest uh, so that those students who are coming through our public schools where more than 90 percent of the students in georgia are educated in our public schools we can make a tremendous difference for our future if we make the right kinds of choices and so to me the distraction around critical race theory and what's the curriculum and what we're going to be teaching our kids is a distraction over the last 20 years we have failed fully invest, fully fund our education funding formula. Uh, I think two times we may have out of the 20 years. My daughter just graduated from high school and in her entire high school uh, K-12 experience, she's only realized two years of full funding. That's shameful. That is shameful. Acceptable. And we need to be talking about that and not talking about critical race theory, whether or not we teach children history. Come on, Dominique. I mean, really. So don't get me started. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's a conversation <laughs> that I would like to get started on if we had more time. <laughs> if we had more time. <laughs> yes, because we could do but again, a deep dive just on that. <laughs> tremendous opportunities ahead. And I just hope people feel activated and galvanized to really make a difference. That's right. I mean, this is a really there's so much happening right now in our environment, but I think that this is a really critical opportunity and a moment where, like you said, these are all choices. We can make different choices. That's right. You know, and like Period. to your point about the public and political will, you know, and continuing to build that, I think we know that a lot of that already exists. <laughs> That's um, right. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue to, to build momentum and to push forward in creating this, you know, equitable society and economy that everyone in Georgia can benefit from. Because right now we know that that's not that's not the case. That's right. Um, so that's really all our time for today. But I did want to see, you know, Taifa, any final words before we close? You know, um, we are. <laughs> It's a bittersweet moment, obviously, um, with this transition, although we're extremely excited for you. We know you're going to do incredible things for economic justice over at Demos. But um, yeah, any any last words today? I would just say again, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to work with this tremendous team. Those of you who've been our partners on the ground, who we've learned from you, uh, those in the different spaces around the state that we went to, Albany, Rome, Floyd, Savannah, Macon, um, you know, North Georgia, who allowed us to hear your stories, to sit in a room and listen uh, to your dreams and aspirations for your communities. That has been so informative and so meaningful uh, for those of us who do this policy work on your behalf. Um, and I'm just excited to uh, see what's next for Georgia, for what's next for GBPI. I think it's really important that 
you know, as we as as leaders uh, take stock of what we've been able to do and, and the investments we've been made, able to make and, you know, our sort of legacy looking back on what we've accomplished. I'm so proud of the work we've done together at GBPI for the last 10 years to see working with partners postpartum Medicaid expanded for six months to see a need based aid uh, program created, though it's still not full funded. So we got to continue to work on that uh, to see you know child care subsidies be expanded for ineligibility changes for more people like student parents i mean just those few things that we've been able to proffer that have been positive um, but also the fact that we've also had to play defense um, and i think you know in this upcoming season we're going to have to both dream and play offense and defense the same time to, to realize the Georgia we want. So I'm just really excited to see you all continue to work with GBPI. I will continue to be a partner and a friend and a supporter and a champion uh, from my different seat. <laughs> but we're still in the movement together for change. That's right. All people in this country can fare well and thrive. So I'm excited. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Taifa, for your leadership. Thank you for just all of the support and mentorship and friendship that you've given and shared. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and for joining us for this conversation. Uh, so that's all we've got for this afternoon. See you next time. Bye, y'all.